comes to pop culture superstardom, one Marvel hero is truly head, shoulders, and webs above the rest. Your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man has found fame in just about every possible medium. TV, cartoons, merchandise, games, music, Broadway, we will get to turn off the dark later. And movies, of course. Spider-Man Homecoming has killed it at the box office. So what better time to take a look at the journey of Marvel's first multimedia star? The 1967 Spider-Man cartoon was Spidey's first spin-off, five years after his comics debut. And while seasons two and three were absurdly weird and undercut by penny-pinching producers, the first season was on point. It featured classic villains like the Green Goblin and Dr. Octopus, and it had the greatest theme song ever. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. In fact, Spidey has starred in seven animated series. Following the classic 60s tune, he turned up again in 1981's Spider-Man. This only lasted 26 episodes, but if you catch them on Netflix or on a, I don't know, bootleg DVD at a con, the animation is decent and features all sorts of great guest stars and heroes and villains. Spider-Man and his amazing friends then followed with a three-season run in the early 80s, but then Peter was all like, who needs amazing friends, going back to a solo series lasting five seasons in the 1990s. This version is widely considered to be Spidey's high watermark in animation. Then he swung into a couple of one-season wonders. MTV's Spider-Man, the new animated series in 2003, was developed by Brian Michael Bendis and featured stunning CGI animation, Neil Patrick Harris as Peter, and Lisa Loeb as the voice of Mary Jane. Curse you, MTV, for axing this awesome show way too early. Come on. 2008's The Spectacular Spider-Man did what Spider-Man Homecoming does. It takes Peter Parker back to high school where he belongs. It was absurdly funny and effortless in its web-slinging joy, but due to complications over Disney buying up Marvel, the animated series was canceled after just two seasons. Breaking geek hearts everywhere, and honestly, our hearts break enough, we didn't need this. Ultimate Spider-Man just wrapped its four-season run this year, paving the way for another animated Spidey series titled, yet again, Spider-Man. Hmm, they are kind of running out of names for these shows. But while Peter Parker has crushed it in animated TV, live action is a different story. His first live action venture began in 1974 on PBS with future Oscar winner and history's greatest narrator, Morgan Freeman, introducing him during the Spidey Super Stories skits on The Electric Company. Say, listen, speaking of Spider-Man, guess who's going to be on The Electric Company? Here, Spidey showed off a previously undiscovered superpower, the ability to help little kids learn to read. He never spoke in the skits, instead using clever word balloons so young viewers would practice their reading skills. Why these skits haven't been released on DVD is a true mystery. We do know why 1978's The Amazing Spider-Man series starring Nicholas Hammond isn't on DVD, cause it's terrible. Instead of facing his classic rogues gallery, Spider-Man fought thieves, generic whack jobs, and cult leaders and it featured the worst example of web shooting in the history of ever. Despite all this, the show was a top 20 show in the ratings, but CBS canceled it anyway. Fun fact, this show is the only time we've seen a version of the Spider Tracer in a live action series or movie. Spider-Man was also a TV star in Japan. The self-titled Tokusatsu series ran for 41 episodes, but aside from the familiar costume, virtually nothing from the series resembled the Spidey we know and love from the comics. He got his powers from an alien and had a robot sidekick. On the other hand, the stunt work was solid and the cheesy effects do have some charm. The 1970s was when Peter Parker truly blew up. Spider-Man was comics' biggest star, so naturally someone made a Spider-Man rock opera. Spider-Man Rock Reflections of a Superhero showed off Spidey's musical chops. A nifty Stanley narration ties together an album of songs so absurd it's basically Spidey on LSD. I mean, how else do you explain a song about Doc Ock with this chorus? <laughs> That's not even the weirdest part of the album, because besides the gorgeous John Romita cover painting, we get this glorious back cover featuring Marvel's greatest heroes as studio musicians. Oh look, there's Silver Surfer on keyboard, Captain America on percussion, and Conan the Barbarian on strings, which really feels like it's playing against type because you would think Conan's more of a percussion guy, you know, like banging and aggression and stuff. I don't know. This leads us to Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. We're sure you've heard about it. 
Six actors and stunt doubles were hurt during the aerial acrobatic scenes. Honestly, we're pretty sure the New York Post had someone on the turn off the dark beat to track who was the next cast member to almost die. On top of the technical woes, the whole thing was just... I don't know, it was weird. And look, we like U2, but Bono wasn't exactly touched by the Angel of Harlem with these songs. Also, there was a lady villain in it called Swiss Miss that was made up of just knives, so I don't know, soak that in. It was weird. Turn Off the Dark lasted two and a half years before it finally closed. Its legacy is Broadway's biggest punchline, unfortunately secured. Meanwhile, producers keep threatening to revive the show in Las Vegas. Why? And uh, while we're talking live performance, we can't forget about the Spider-Man Live Stunt Spectacular, which was actually kind of a hit back in 2002 as it toured the country. But another arena Spider-Man has excelled in is video games. From the Atari 2600 to the Sega Genesis and the NES, Spidey's always been popular with gamers. Even the movie tie-in games have been well received. And because we love vintage coin-op games, we're throwing some love to the 1991 Spider-Man the video game. We all know about Spider-Man's movie history, right? I mean, there's the Sam Raimi trilogy, which was mostly awesome. I mean, Spider-Man 2 is truly amazing, until the third film introduces the amazing Spider-Bro. Mm. Then there's the two amazing Spider-Man movies, which most aren't so hot on. I don't know, maybe Sally Field is. Hey, maybe you are. Don't tell us to shut up in the comments, if so. Despite the great chemistry of Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone, this film series kind of came and went. But wait, what about Spidey's first film appearance? It wasn't in 2002. It was in 1978. Spider-Man the movie was a spin-off of the Japanese TV series. You know, the weird one that we mentioned earlier? The movie was set in the continuity of the TV series, which was just as faithful to the original comics as the TV show was, aka not at all. My favorite part is when he summons his Marveler spacecraft. Guys, this was the best Marvel could do before Kevin Feige. But now look at what we get. After his spectacular appearance in Captain America Civil War, he's got his own blockbuster, and Spider-Man Homecoming is already considered perhaps the best Spider-Man movie ever. So I think it's safe to say we can expect some more Spidey movies. We know we've got another animated series coming, video games, but please, Marvel, for the love of Aunt May, please, no more Broadway musicals. Stop. So what did you think of our history lesson on Spider-Man and his multi-platform greatest hits? Hit the comments and let us know.